How are you doing, guys? Uh, Bill Walton, white guy. Jerry West, last episode, white guy. Larry Bird, first episode, white guy. See the, see the theme there? Uh, you can be an all-star as a white guy in basketball, but you gotta be good and smart. You can be an all-star player as a jazz guy, as a white guy, but you gotta bring something to the table. Uh, we're talking about the great white saxophone players. We're, we're counting down 50 to down to number one. And I do want to point out, this isn't really ranking them as best to worst, worst to best. It's not that. <clears throat> For the most part, anyone from 20 up is going to be fairly interchangeable in terms of their obscurity. The top 20 guys is going to be a lot more recognition with who these players are. But really, 20 through 50, you can throw them in a hat and pull them out. And it's just the order I kind of researched them in get some dates and some times and places for you so they're not really in order and it's only only when you get to the top 10 where these guys start having larger discographies of work as I mentioned in volume 1 and volume 2 of this series it's been interesting to see how obscure most of these guys are to today's collector and to today's uh, jazz mind <clears throat> and when I did some research and really looked into a lot of these guys, most of these guys were well-renowned names in jazz that wouldn't have been unknown to the jazz buyer of that time. And it's the black guys that we know today that were probably living mostly in obscurity to, to the average jazz collector. You know, uh, Riverside and Blue Note wasn't selling millions of copies. They were selling hundreds, sometimes thousands of copies of records. And it was really regional. And a lot of these white cats had far more reach with their publicity and their time on television, late night shows, college campus tours. White guys had a lot more access to selling records and, and building fame. And even though they're kind of exploiting the black art form, most of them did it with a great degree of integrity and ability. And a lot, a lot of times they had better instruments, better training, better education, better studios. Uh, Van Gelder recorded all that great black music on the East Coast, in large part because that was the only place the black guys could go. And so his name, Van Gelder, then gets attached to so many great recordings from Impulse, from Verve, from uh, Blue Note, Prestige, Savoy, some early Riverside stuff. His fingers are on all these great black recordings. <clears throat> but unlike a white musician, a black guy just can't show up anywhere and say, we're going to track today. Uh... And so Van Gelder gets, out of necessity, this wonderful reputation. And he was a marvelous engineer. And he does an incredible job, considering a lot of it was recorded out of his parents' living room. And then he eventually builds that space that's wonderful. But uh, the white guys didn't have to worry about that. They had access to the best studios, uh, much bigger budgets, much broader exposure. <clears throat> but yet, time has kind of pushed most of these white guys to the side of the road and elevated a lot of the obscure black guys to the center of the collecting world. A guy like Hank Mobley is a prime example. He's just, now most collectors can't, will crawl over each other to get one, in part because he didn't sell well. But uh, Mobley wasn't as popular as most of these white names that we're referring to now that no one knows anymore. Uh, number 30 on my list is Lars Gulen. Uh, from Gotland, Sweden. So we got quite a bit of, especially on Emerson, quite a bit of the Dane, Scandinavian world coming over to Chicago to record. Possibly some of, some of the stuff is being brought over and just issued on the Mercury Emerson label. Uh, <clears throat> Lars plays the baritone, and he's a wonderful tone. It's interesting. This record's with voices, which is kind of cool. Beautiful blue ink background. This probably was recorded in Europe. It's recorded with Carl Henrik Noren, Rolf Berg, George Riedel, Alan Dawson. Uh, kind of Star trek -y, like a Gil Mel thing a little bit here. Uh, <clears throat> Lars Gulen, 4, 4 May 28, is born. Uh, he's a big, largely influenced by Jerry Mulligan. Uh, he wasn't ashamed to admit that. Uh, and he, especially Birth of the Cool, 4950, he was hearing that stuff. 
and it had a large impact on him. And notice he didn't say Miles Davis, he said Jerry Mulligan. You know, and Mulligan had a big part of the arranging and the compositions of that whole session. If anybody should look that, if anybody's name should be on that session, it should be Jerry Mulligan. But it probably would have sold a third of what it has with Miles' name on it. <clears throat> uh, he worked with James Moody, with Zoot Sims, with uh, Lee Connitz quite a lot. Some notorious Lee Connitz sessions. He toured Europe. Uh, he goes to Europe with Chet, and he's the guy who finds Russ Twardzik dead of heroin in his hotel room. And tragically, that's always going to shake you. And uh, <clears throat> I can't remember what he ends up doing, but I think he ends up working in the, in the studios and doing that kind of work and spending time back in Europe. And I think he plays locally in Europe for a long time. But <clears throat> Lars Gullen, baritone sax, kind of an unknown player today. <clears throat> but he's a great, great character in the history of jazz. This is also on Emerson with the Mortone Singers. And then this one is on Atlantic number 1246 and this one was hard for me to track down I finally found a nice copy not too long ago and I was excited about that so that's Lars Gould one of the great baritone players that's a guy that we're on Jubilee here I believe it's from Newark New Jersey Mike Kuzo And again, he's a great player. And again, <laughs> he would have been pretty well known to people of that time. But he certainly wasn't well known in today's jazz circles. He has another section here on Savoy, almost for sure from before the LP era. Vinnie Costa, Eddie Costa, Vinnie Burke, Ke Ronnie, Kevin Clark, and Ronnie Ball. Great session. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's getting dry here. <clears throat> Born in Newark, New Jersey, New Jersey, June 12th, 1925. He has a great Ben Webster sound. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. He's also on that really cool Mort Herbert uh, LP with a great picture of Times Square and a cover on Savoy. He featured probably on that session as well. <clears throat> he got married, did a housing development in New Jersey, and then he ends up having a, a, a car lot and sells cars for a long time. And after he got married, he kind of quit music. <clears throat> he still played locally, but he didn't want to tour. He didn't want to leave his wife. He wanted to stay here in New Jersey around fellow Italians, eat his gabagool, and he lived in uh, 2005 or something like that quite a long time but when people are comparing you to Ben Webster you're the real deal gorgeous and I really would recommend Mike Kuzo quite a lot he's a fantastic player now another guy that comes along in Emerson <clears throat> number 28 on my list I found this at Bob's Jazz record bar in Chicago. A guy by the name of Charlie Ventura. This is called FYI for your information. Uh, Bill Harris is on the trombone. Charlie Shaver is one of my favorites. He's on the trumpet. Chubby Jackson's on the bass. Dave Tuff is on the drums. Uh, this is Roy Crow and Jackie Kay on the vocals. Ralph Burns on the piano. Charlie's a fantastic player. And uh, <clears throat> born December 2nd, 1916. He's born in Philly. The tour is another Italian name by the sounds of it. He uh, plays in, in the 40s with Gene Krupa. In the 45, he wins Downbeats Award for the best saxophone player. He led a band with Conti Condoli and Benny Green and Boots and Jackie, Boots Buzzilli and Jackie and Roy going to make a lot of records together as a vocal duo. Uh, in the 60s, he's playing with Krupa again, and then he eventually goes to Vegas and bats Jackie Gleason's lounge act for a long time, which is kind of comical, you know? The, this isn't the ending, black 
porn players get. How many of these guys ended up in Vegas lounges? Drinking cocktails and having a gay old time. It's, it's pretty interesting where these guys end up. So Ventura's a great player. Bill Harris and the trombone there is fantastic. Uh, Ventura makes this record as well at Emerson, jumping with Ventura. Neil Hefty's on this one, Benny Green, Charlie Shavers, Buck Clinton, uh, sorry, Buck Clayton, Kai Winding, Tony Scott, Jackie Kane, and Buddy Stewart. Great stuff. And this was recorded by Regent, which is a Savoy sister label. And a lot of the same players that shows up here, Tough Man, Burns, Clayton Harris, Chubby Jackson, <clears throat> Charlie Ventura. Another guy from the East Coast, Philadelphia. Number 27 now? Who could possibly be next? Oh, wait, one more. Charlie Ventura on Verb with Marianne McCall. Another great record. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Sandy Mossy. And Sandy Mossy records a couple of great records at the Argo label in Chicago. I like Sandy Mossy's records a lot. This album cover is fantastic. Sorry about the tape on the top, but it's still holding together. This is his other record. It's actually a Fresh Sounds record reissue. I've never seen an original of that yet. Born May 29, 1929 in Detroit, Michigan. Heard Lester Young and wanted to play like Lester Young. Uh, at a young age, he's playing clarinet, alto. Eventually he moves to the tenor. In the 50s, he goes to Chicago. He's playing with guys like Bill Russo, uh, Chubby Jackson, the great James Moody, uh, Cy Tooth, and he's, he's tracking on a lot of the other Argo sessions by those guys. And then he eventually moves to Holland in the 1970s and stays in Europe for the rest of his life. But Sandy Mossy, a guy you don't hear much about, made two great records at Argo. And again, his track record, his... Uh, the guys he played with, there was a reason why Argo put these records out, you know? Now we're moving into a little bit more of a modern guy here, number 26. And I could have maybe put this guy a little bit higher, but I don't listen to him a ton. Steve Lacey. And this is one of the guys that's really of a much later vintage the most everyone we've talked about so far. And a lot of you guys are going to know who Steve Lacey was. Born on July 23rd, 1934, New York City. A guy who brought the soprano saxophone into prominence. Uh, he played early on something called a progressive Dixieland. Which, I don't know what that even means. Progressive Dixieland sounds interesting. He was a fairly experimental player messed with the avant-garde and the edges of free jazz, yet he was always melodic and always kind of structured his arrangements so that they never went too far off the path. I'm a pretty big uh, proponent of that he likes these colors. This is that Prestige 7125, New Jazz 8206, and this on Candid 8007. Uh, it's funny how similar those album covers are, color-wise. But he was a very experimental player. Uh, he played with Monk briefly, and Monk changes him forever, just like Coltrane. Monk will change you forever. And he never took Monk out of his sets. When you went to go see Lacey, he would always play Monk songs, but he'd make a record that would always be Monk compositions on there. It was a big part of how he always felt about it. And then Roswell rudding him ended up making some pretty edgy exploratory music into the late 60s, into the 70s even. So that's Steve Lacey. Again, one of the great soprano sax players. Certainly much more modern than most of the guys on this list. But also not a guy I listen to a ton. And I don't think his records sold particularly well either. So he's definitely from a different school than most of these guys. But we're, we're still going to see, though, as we kind of moving forward here, that there's going to be a lot of 
more familiar names starting to show up now. Now we're up to number 26. Nope, sorry, number 25. A guy by the name of Warren Marsh. <clears throat> this is on Atlantic Records. And uh, Warren, not Wayne, it's Warren. I always say Wayne Marsh, but it's Warren Marsh, which is a strange name, no question about it. Warren Marsh is a great player. <coughs> you'll see on this record he's playing with Ronnie Ball from Savoy, Paul Motion, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. That's a pretty serious group he's playing with there. And the group you play with can always lend some credibility to who you are. Uh, he plays a lot with Lee Connitz, and he had a record early on with Lee Connitz on Atlantic. That's where I first heard of him. Uh, he was born October 26, 1927, from L.A. He was a protege of Lenny Tristano, and actually was taught by Lenny Tristano a lot of how to play, not to play cliches, worry about long lines, and not quoting simple, memorable things, but the whole encompass of what you're doing. Think of the, the bigger scale of the piece. Uh, sadly, uh, he dies on stage while playing. I, th I believe in the 80s. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of guys who would say they would like to go that way. But that might not be the funnest thing for your audience. If you're on a date to experience your uh, entertainment pass away in front of you. But uh, he, according to the guy, Anthony Braxton, it says few guys played more vertically than what Wayne Marsh does. Uh, sorry, Warren Marsh does. And what he means by that is, when you see a piece of music, it moves this way. And the melody is moving this way. But when you get into harmony and start disseminating the chords, you actually start moving up within the structure of the piece, not this way. And According to Anthony Braxton, no one did that better than Warren Marsh. Really plays wonderfully with a sense of, and probably Lady Tristano had something to do with that as well. This is on Atlantic number 1291. The one with Lee Conn is probably number 1235 in there somewhere. Both of these are great records. He's a guy worth seeking out, and he's got some real modern edges to him. So I think there's a lot of guys up there in jazz land today who will dig this guy's recordings. And again, he's playing with Paul Chambers, Philly Joe Jones, Paul Motion, and Ronnie Ball. So it's a pretty serious lineup he's got there. Uh, that leads us to number 24. And this is a name that's going to be probably more familiar now. A guy by the name of Gene Quill. And Gene Quill plays a lot with Phil Woods, Phil and Quill. Pretty common name there. And we'll see Phil Woods coming up. 20. But uh, Gene Quill is a nice player, one of the three Q's in my collection, along with Paul Kittiche, Ike Quebec, and Gene Quill. And uh, he's an alto player. Gene Quill is born December 15, 1927, in the Atlantic City, New Jersey. He plays with Phil Woods throughout his career, off and on. He plays with Buddy DeFranco, Jerry Mulligan, Gene Krupa. Quincy Jones. Uh, he's on that Four Altos record with Sahib Shihab and Hal Stein and Phil Woods. Uh, he plays with Manny Albom, uh, Al Cohn, Bob Brookmeyer. So really he's got a fairly impressive pedigree. This is on the Roos label, Three Bones and a Quill. And it looks like that's possibly J.J. Johnson. Who are the trombone players here, guys? Oh, it's not Jimmy Cleveland. Frank Rehack, Jim Dahl, and, and Frank Rehack, Jim Dahl, and Jimmy Cleveland. <laughs> I think that's Rehack, and I know that's Jimmy Cleveland right there. Great record. Great record with Phil Woods. Always enjoy Phil and Quill together. He has quite a large body of work as a sideman. Definitely a protege of Parker. <clears throat> Love Bebop and uh, a great 
fairly heralded white sax player that people say are going to know something about. That leads us to number 23. <clears throat> Sal Mistico. And Sal Mistico came to my attention through the Mangione brothers. The Mangione brothers, Gap and Chuck, go back all the way to the late 50s at Riverside when they were the brothers playing together and uh, they're playing traditional jazz at that point. And Sal Mistico is playing with them. And it's, they're actually great records. <clears throat> and uh, Sal Mistico, I'm sure we're going the right way here, was born on April, April 2nd, 1940. So you see our dates are starting to move forward. He's born in Syracuse. Uh, he was a part of Woody Herman's herd once again played alto and tenor. He, uh, in 65, joins Basie, Basie's group for a while. So you know that guy can swing hard. Uh, his solo work tends to be more bebop than his side work, where he's playing much more in the swing settings of Basie and Herman. Uh, he plays with Dusko Gojkovic's sextet. He plays with trombone player Carl Fontana. So Sal Nisigo plays around quite a lot. Uh, he's a great player with a great tone. And he's really kind of unheralded in a lot of ways. Sal Amico is on the trumpet there. But his records at Riverside, this is Riverside 457, Jazzland 66. These are both really solid modern jazz records. This one has Nat Adderley, Barry Harris, Walter Perkins, and Sam Jones. So, serious business. You know, serious stuff by Sal Nistico here. And a guy definitely modern jazz fans should be looking for. That leads us to number 22, J.R. Montrose. J.R. Montrose a great player and he's very underappreciated and uh, he's one of the few white cats that Alfred Lyon at Blue Note records. You had a hip, the German piano pianist, and Jerry Monterose and Gil Mal, that's about it. It's a pretty short list. And for uh, Alfred Lyon to let you in the door, you had to be a guy that could swing and, and make make an impression. Uh, this record has Iris Sullivan, also a guy you don't see a blue not much. Horace Silver and Wilbur Ware with Philly Joe Jones on the drums. A great blue note session. This is on the Jaro label. Pretty tough record to come by. The message. Uh, Jared Montrose, born 19 July 19, 1927. Uh, he's a tenor player from Detroit, moved to Utica. Uh, Coleman Hawkins was a big influence on him. He cites Bud Powell, though, for his harmonic inspirations. And again, har harmonic is that vertical plane. And uh, <clears throat> he played with Claude Thornhill, Teddy Charles, Charlie Mingus' Pithecanthus Mr. Rectus. He's on some Kenny Dorham stuff. Uh, then he eventually goes to Europe, kind of disappears off the American radar. And <clears throat> A lot of people are going to know him because he was on Blue Note. And on, oddly enough, that's what kind of separates a lot of these players from today's radar is that they, don't, they aren't on the black labels. They're on the more white or more mixed use labels. And Montrose being on Blue Note gives him some connection with today's collector, which a lot of these guys do not get. And that leads me to number 21 on my list, Serge Chaloff, Serge Chaloff. Another guy from Boston, another baritone sax player. This was a record I told you that Boots Wuzili also played on with him. Uh, 
born November 24, 1923. A great baritone player. He had a really broad sound. His range was really impressive. Uh, he could play from almost an audible whisper to a great sonora shouts, one reviewer said. Uh, he's a part of the, the four brothers with uh, Zut Sims, Al Cohn, that whole scene. He plays on a lot of their records as a side guy. Boston Blow Up is a pretty famous record. This is, of course, the, the Fable of Mabel. It's on Storyville. And then he does this record out west on Capitol. And this is with Sonny Clark, believe it or not, who was out west at this point. The Ear White Vinegar and Joe Jones. And is that Philly Joe? I think it is. I think that's Philly Joe. Yeah, it's Philly Joe. <clears throat> this is a great record. One of the best records on Capitol in terms of really great modern jazz that's not watered down. All three of these sort of shallow records are worth finding. And like I said, you'll see a lot of surge on uh, those RCA labels with Cone and uh, Zook Sims, which of course tells you that those are two of the guys coming up in this series is Al Cone and Zook Sims. Baritone sax is a great sounding horn. So that wraps it up for today. That gets us to number 21. We got 20 more guys coming. And my guess is as we get into this next 20, there'll be more and more stuff that you guys recognize. But uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this. I've had fun compiling it. It's always fun playing with my records. And Make your guesses now <clears throat> as who's going to be in the top 20. And I'm guessing by the time I'm done the next 10, you guys will all know who is in the top 10 because those top 10 guys are all fairly big names. But uh, guys that are very much on the periphery of jazz now, but definitely weren't at the time this stuff came out. And that's kind of a revelation to me too because a, a lot of times when I was buying this stuff, I'm like, who are these guys? Why did they get to record so much? And then you really realize that in the lineage and the story of this music, <clears throat> these guys were quite prominent at that time. So, forgotten, but still worth collecting and finding and hearing these guys. A lot of them are really great players that deserve more recognition in today's market, but it's the nature of the beast. And there's nothing wrong <clears throat> with the black players who didn't get credit in their lifetimes receiving that credit now. So that's the Bill Walton's Jerry West and Larry Burns of the saxophone so far. Hope you've enjoyed the top 30. We got 20 more to go. Check in tomorrow when I make the next episodes. Peace. <laughs>